this has been a series of six webinars. So we've had five already, and we're going to have another exciting one today, learning more about pollination, crop pollination, and um, we've had the opportunity to talk about almonds, apples, cherries, pumpkins, and numerous crops, and we hope that these these webinars will benefit you in the, in the audience. I welcome you for attending. Um, we've had a good time doing this, and we have an excellent speaker today, and um, this will be the last one, but as Mark said, they are recorded. You can go back and check it out and get some more information because it moves right along. So, Katharina, would you please introduce our speaker for the day? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, John. And thank you to everyone on the webinar today. It's so great to see so many people here. Um, we're really excited to have Teresa Pitzinger to present on how to manage solitary orchard bees for crop pollination. Uh, for those of you who weren't at the first webinar of the series, which Teresa also presented, Teresa is a research entomologist with the USDA ARS and part of the integrated crop pollination pollination project. She's uh, leading efforts there related to the use of non-honeybees for crop pollination. Her research team focuses on improving commercial scale use and management of blue orchard bees for fruit and nut trees and alfalfa leaf cutting bees for alfalfa. Um, she has over 15 years of experience working in these systems with alternative managed bees and so we're really excited to have her here today to share her knowledge about this topic. Um, she's going to be going through her entire presentation and we'll have time at the end of her presentation to um, answer questions. But if questions come up during the talk, don't forget to ask them in the Q&A box like Mark suggested. Um, and uh, while we're getting ready to switch screens to uh, share Teresa's presentation, I'm going to ask Mark to post a poll um, just to get a sense of who's on the call uh, or on this webinar today and uh, um, uh, get a little background information from you all for uh, context. Okay, folks, that poll should be up now and we'll give you about 30 seconds to uh, enter your answers there. And while you're doing that, I'll also mention that there are certified crop advisor credits available today for this webinar. I'll be posting a uh, link to a Google form at the end of the webinar. That link will be posted in the chat box. And uh, when you click on that, you can enter in your name and CCA number so that we make sure you get credits for participating today. And um, assuming Mark, that things are looking good with the poll, I'll ask Teresa to uh, share her uh, screen and begin with her presentation. We're excited to hear it. And I'll go ahead and share while she's sharing that, I'll go ahead and share the uh, results of the poll. So I'm gonna share results. Can you see those, Katherine? Yeah, we can, great, thanks so much. All right, you ready for me? Yep. Hey, thanks for attending everybody. Um, it's nice to be the bookends of this nice series of especially crop pollination. I've started this with almond pollination. I'm gonna end it with uh, more orchard stuff, but I'm gonna highlight almond pollination again as I explain to you more about how we manage solitary bees for this uh, pollination endeavor. So um, if you've been uh, a regular attendee of these uh, of this series, you'll have seen this slide before, but it asks, wants to know um, if you understand what is integrative crop pollination. We're a part of the project ICP, and what it does is look at um, how to provide reliable and economic, economical pollination of crops. And in order to do that, we have to integrate these pollinators into the cropping system, which includes all of these different sort of petals of this flower, which is pesticide stewardship, honeybees, other managed bees, wild bees, uh, enhancement of habitats, nesting sites, and forage, and horticultural products. Today, I'm going to 
people which are alternative managed bees, that is the solitaries, and uh, some, um, in one part, some habitat enhancements. Uh, this project ICP included lots of collaborators and advisors, and um, so some of the uh, information I give you today were provided by people in this picture, as well as a lot of their photographs that they took during field seasons and some of their data. Um, I'd also, also like to mention that my research team at the USDA Agricultural Research Service um, played a large part in uh, what I'm about to tell you, and are some of the list living history of how solitary bees uh, started to uh, be developed into management systems for crop pollination. So first off, I'd like to uh, mention what's the difference uh, between solitary bees and social bees? So uh, you kind of get my, my drift of why this is important to, to make this uh, uh, distinguish, uh, to distinguish uh, between all these is that honeybees and uh, bumblebees are really the only social bees that are managed in the United States. And when we think of bees, oftentimes these are the only two bees we think about. But really most of the bees are solitary bees, such as the osmia bees, which are called mason, mason bees, orchard bees, or jewel bees, depending on kind of where they are, what they do. Uh, Megachyle rotundata, which is the managed alfalfa leaf cutting bee. It's actually imported into the states, but uh, it's here nonetheless as an alfalfa pollinator. And then most of those solitary bees are really ground nesting bees. And um, there's a worldwide about 25,000 species of bees, only a few of which are social. So most of the bees that we have are solitary, and, and of the native bees in the United States, they're, the, they're really just the solitary bees and the bumblebees. Looking a little more into depth, like with the life history of, of such bees, the social bees live in colonies. So they have a queen and many workers, and they kind of live in a common household. Whereas the solitary bees, the ones that are managed, are cavity nesting bees. And they can live in large nesting aggregations, such as uh, seen in these boxes or in these uh, big shelters, so, so that they uh, will nest near each other, but each female is the, the queen or the reproductive for every single nest. So she does all the work and the laying of eggs, whereas in the social colonies, just the queen lays the eggs, more or less. A little more closer up look at that shows you how, you know, it takes gazillions of, of uh, the tens of thousands of honeybees to kind of be the managers of the colony to raise brood, forage for resources, and then only one queen to run around and lay all the eggs. And she's kept inside and protected by um, this big worker force. Bumblebees are a little simpler and they have an annual life cycle and where you have kind of a solitary phase of hibernate, hibernating queens that go out in the spring to establish new nests. And then they produce workers who help her then gather enough resources to produce reproductives, males and females, in the fall, or by the fall, when the males and females will mate and everybody in the colony dies except for new mated queens that overwinter and keep the cycle going. Paper wasps do the same sort of colony cycle. So they're called uh, primitively eusocial. So um, how does that contrast with the life cycle of a solitary bee? Here you see a, uh, an example of the cavity nesting bee, which is Osmia lignaria, and the bees uh, overwinter in cocoons as adults, so that in the springtime they're uh, ready to emerge, mate, go out and forage for the resources they need for nest building, and then they build those nests by using uh, soil to make mud plugs and partitions between little nest cells and linear cavities. They collect pollen and nectar upon which they lay an egg, and then they seal off each cell. And on the left-hand side of the screen, you see that the provision masses with little eggs on them are larger than the ones towards the right side of the screen in this nest. And that's because the females are laid first and the males are laid later. So the males are smaller than females. Males actually emerge earlier than the females, so they need to be on the front end to chew their way out and then wait for the females to come out. So the larvae develop in those nests throughout the whole summer through the uh, pre-pupil stage, which is this larval stage that spins the cocoon and, and finishes uh, feeding and defecating. And so it spins that cocoon and it's all ready to go to change to the pupa and then the adult. And that happens before um, the end of the summer so that again, we have these bees ready to overwinter in the fall. An example of a ground nesting bee is uh, Nelmia melanderi, which is the alkali bee and it's um, a native to the United States. These bees burrow uh, tunnels under the ground, leaving tumuli up at the top of the, um, of the soil. 
and they nest in very sandy soils out in the west. And so they build uh, individual chambers down in the soil in which they provision a pollen nectar mass upon which they lay an egg. And that whole cell is sort of sealed with a uh, dufour's gland, a, a glandular uh, secretion kind of related to the sting apparatus. Uh, and it smears it in there to protect that provision from uh, molding and, and uh, becoming contaminated with, with particles, with contaminants out of the soil. So the larva develops on that provision mass. And then these bees, just like al alfalfa leaf cutting bee, um, they overwinter as pre pupae. So it's a, a large larva in a cocoon. And then they hatch out in the early summer. So um, switching now to the crops that I'm going to talk about a little are uh, the specialty crops that are orchard crops. And they are mostly almonds, cherries, and apples. And uh, the, what I'm going to highlight today is how we manage uh, blue orchard bees for uh, almonds out in California. So these here. So first a little about almonds. Um, they are uh, grown in the Central Valley of California where it's the, the huge export crop. We're the number one producers of almonds in the world. Uh, all the honeybees uh, colonies in the country pretty much are exported from where they are over the winter to California for this large pollination event. And there's about 900,000 acres of almonds right now in California, which uses two honeybee hives per acre, meaning almost two million colonies of bees are transported to California or are already located locally in California for this pollination event. And here's an example of what those uh, colonies look like when they're kind of dropped off into these holding areas. So for almonds, pollination is required. And traditionally, the honeybees are used as pollinators. And the value of this pollination is around $15 billion, and that's an old estimate. So this is a very important uh, job for the honeybees, and not only important for the bees, but for the beekeepers in money making, and then for the almond producers in getting their crop done. So in February, the almond trees will bloom in mass. They are a non-native species, and so they're kind of out of sync with the other uh, native orchard trees that we have. And not every row is a target production row. So in this case, um, a lot of the trees that are grown in California are the, what they want to grow are the non pareil nuts, which are a soft shell, nice almond. And so every other row is non pareil. And the opposite row is a pollinizer, which is, uh, blooms a little before or a little after non pareil so that you have a lot of flow between the pollinizer and the target uh, variety to get the um, uh, fertile, to get the, the flowers fertilized so that you can have a nut. So th from March to June, the almonds develop on the trees. And then in late summer, early fall, the trees are, the trees are shaken such that the almonds fall off and then the almonds can be picked up out of these rows. So in order to pollinate an almond flower, the pollen has to get from the anthers to the stigma. And here I've highlighted those, those parts of the flower. But the bees, and the bees will be interested in collecting the pollen, but they will also be interested in collecting the nectar from the base of the flower. So how bees handle these flowers is important. So what makes a blue orchard bee very effective at pollination is that she collects the pollen dry on her scopa, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, but, but here it is um, on the underside of her body. It's a stout uh, set of hairs that pollen will collect on easily. And then when she visits the flower, the way she crawls around on the flower allows her to deliver ample amounts of pollen. And she also likes to move around between rows. And this is actually, the top picture is an apple orchard to, sh to show you that, again, here are the uh, changes in the varieties between rows of, of apples, uh, which also need this, this cross-pollination. And the blue orchard bees likes to bu buzz back and forth between rows, as opposed to staying on the same tree to visit many flowers on the same tree. 
Looking a little more closely at what a honeybee does, here you see on the left-hand side the pollen pellets that, are, that have been knocked off of the legs of a honeybee, like the one in the, the pictures in the middle and on the right. You can see that the pollen basket holds a, a wetted pollen on the legs of the honeybees. So then when they visit flowers, they don't necessarily drop off that much uh, pollen onto a, a waiting stigma. So um, this makes them a little less efficient in that sense at pollinating flowers compared to a blue orchard bee that's kind of sloppy and messy when they go about collecting the pollen and, and nectar from trees and they kind of get all over the flowers and maybe even dirty up the flowers such that even when a honeybee visits, they'll pick up extra pollen that was from a different variety and spread that around. So there, there's a good chance for synergism between these two species because of the way they each individually visit the flowers, one methodically, one kind of sloppily, but the sloppy behavior of the blue orchard bee might actually help the honeybee pick up some of that leftover mess, deliver it to a different variety that she visits, and then she'll visit a lot of flowers on that variety. So this is one thing that's being explored. So how do we manage the blue orchard bee out in these or in uh, different orchards that can be pollinated by them? Well, there's a book that was uh, published in around 2001, How to Manage the Blue Orchard Bee, and it's meant for small scale orchards and um, oftentimes best used in a more organic situation. And uh, this book is available online for free. It's just downloadable. It's no longer available in print. So just Google that name and you'll get that that book and you can just download it to your computer. So this is my postdoc, Natalie Do uh, Boyle, who's out checking out almond flowers, actually counting some for a project. So in order to start using the blue orchard bees, you have to get some. So where do we get some of these cocoons that are not, they're kind of scraped out or punched or pushed out of the nest cells? You can buy them from people who trap them out of the wild or who manage them in other ways. And to get those, you just search the World Wide Web and say, you know, want to buy blue orchard bees and you'll find uh, several entrepreneurs who sell them. Um, you could also manage them once you get them going, manage them in orchards and hopefully get return on these bees. And then also mass propagate them. And I'll show you some examples of these later. To get this bee supply from wild trapping, people go to um, usually mountain ranges in Utah and Washington, and they put out a trap nest. And so they can be bundles of reeds, uh, wood blocks with holes, uh, the correct size of holes drilled into them, or they can be bundles of tubes like down here. And so they're usually put out on old snags. But a paper just came out um, and was just sent to me yesterday about some of the consequences of trapping from the wild. First off, if you're, you can't, you're not supposed to trap on uh, public lands and national and state parks, uh, although that sometimes happens. But even if you're trapping on private lands, there is, um, there is the concern that if you're removing a lot of bees from the ecosystem, you may be disrupting their ecosystem function, which is to pollinate the native plants in those areas. And you could be depleting that source of bees from the area. And not just the bees that you want to collect, like in this case, blue orchard bees. There are other osmia bees and other uh, types of bees and wasps that also use those cavities. And when those are removed and not replaced, but instead destroyed, then that again could disrupt an ecosystem. And then there's also the uh, potential cause of harm when shipping uh, trapped bees to places where they really don't occur naturally across the states or into Canada or even into other countries. So uh, those are all uh, concerns to about just wild trapping. But it would be ideal if we could use these bees in a cropping system and then get them back out of the system at the end of the season. And here you see uh, another postdoc of mine, Derek Arts, hanging um, a nest in an almond tree and then bundles in, on the right-hand side in a mailbox tote used in a cherry orchard, and then another uh, way of collecting and putting out the bees um, is in with some PVC tubes and um, just inserting bundles of, um, 
cardboard tubes inside those PVC tubes. But for orchard pollination, for some reason, we have a little bit of a problem with the bees dispersing from the sites. Even though maybe the only crop blooming, they don't stay at the sites where you release them, and they don't necessarily use these cavities. On top of that, the pesticides that are necessary for producing nice quality uh, fruit and nuts are oftentimes used um, at times when the bees can be exposed to that. And I'll touch on that a little bit later in this talk. So one other way to get bees is to mass propagate them on floral resources that are intentionally uh, placed there for them. And here what I've got are, is an aerial or a, uh, a Google Maps view of uh, wonderful orchards, which is in uh, Southern California. They have a 10 acre plus two five acre enclosures in which they plant floral resources specifically for the purpose of raising blue orchard bees. This is a massive endeavor and it is, there is quite a bit of investment into this. And this is what it looks like at the beginning of the bloom season when the plants have come on, they're just starting to bloom and the nest boxes have been set out, but the bees have not yet been released. And here's another photograph of once the flowers are really in bloom, and this is a phacelia. And you see that there are various different types of uh, nesting contraptions here lodged onto the poles. And um, my postdoc, Natalie, has been working with the wonderful orchard team to see uh, which of these types of nesting uh, designs are best for the bees. And that's what uh, I have here in this picture. Um, and so it's just some preliminary data from last year, and she's found that these uh, shelters that are, there are these boxes that have like a big kind of shady awning on them are ones that the bees tend to nest in more than the other types of nest boxes. We don't know why, but we're, she's testing this again um, in 2017 to see if it holds true. And um, as soon as we kind of understand more about what these bees prefer, we'll then try to figure out why. Another part of managing the bee is assessing what bees you get back in your nesting tubes or blocks or whatever you're using in the orchard. And to do that um, at, the, at our ARS facility and also at Wonderful Orchards, we have a digital x-ray machine, which we use specifically for this purpose. And so we uh, just stretch out the nesting tubes on boards that fit inside the x-ray machine. And then uh, the x-ray is kind of imprinted onto a sheet that's run through a scanner. And then the scanner um, uh, delivers the picture to a computer. And within two minutes, you have uh, an x-ray of what's inside those nests. And so on the bottom of the picture here, you can see that there are adult females to the left in these uh, linear nests. And as you move further to the right, the adult males are present and they're smaller. And if there were any uh, parasites or, or any other problematic cells, we could make sure that they get removed. And these are some of those pests that we might want to remove. Um, during storage and during nesting, these bees get invaded by a wasp blue cospus and another wasp called a sapigia, which is on the, the left, you see eggs on a leaf cutting bee cell, or, or two small wasp eggs on a leaf cutting bee egg that will destroy that egg and eat the provision to develop into an adult wasp, seen here towards the right. Terramalis is, and, uh, and melatobia are smaller wasps that will attack these nest cells. And then in some areas of the states, there's a big problem pollen mites getting into the nest and the pollen act, the pollen mites are actually there to eat the pollen but they will also um, just really get onto the adult bees when they hatch out and, and hitch a ride on those bees but sometimes the bees are totally covered in them and it makes them hard to makes it hard for the adults to fly there's also storage pests that are scavenging beetles and moths and um, we are trying to figure out if there's a way to better trap and monitor uh, emergence of these critters in storage and during incubation time. So if we have pests in those nests, 
we want to remove them. And uh, this is what's going on at the table here. This is, again, at Wonderful Orchards. They have a, a team of women who uh, know these bees very well now. And they are peeling apart the nest straws, taking the cocoons out, and removing any pests or parasites or dead cells. They can also use size and position of the nest cells um, to sort the bees by sex. And then you can know from the, how many bees you put out in the orchards, how many you got back. And if you have a stocking density of around 400 females um, per acre, if you are also using honeybees uh, at a half stocking rate, so one hive per acre, then you can calculate how many bees you may need to buy from trappers or from someone else who is uh, raising these bees somehow. So for our studies, we used uh, cavities uh, like these, the cardboard straws with a, uh, they're cardboard tubes with a paper straw insert placed inside them with a plug in the back. They're bundled together and strapped on a strapping machine and then strapped inside these boxes that we call Fiesta boxes. They're the dark blue ones over on the left. And uh, we, we put out about 1,200 boxes, I think, this year for a demonstration. Um, we have also developed a spray-on attractant. It's, a, it's kind of a lure for uh, blue orchard bees, and we think it works for other Osmia species as well. But it's one component that we found that's very attractive uh, to the bees for deciding where to uh, place their nest. So if you put a side-by-side -side test, sprayed and unsprayed, the bees will go to the sprayed nest, not the unsprayed nest. So this is uh, technician Devin applying that with a squirt bottle um, before these nest boxes are placed in the orchard. So here's an example how the boxes can be distributed in the orchard. What we found from our research is that using more boxes distributed um, throughout the orchard with a few um, bundles of straws in it, as opposed to a lot of bundles of straws, seems to be more attractive to the bees. We also found that they don't like yellow boxes. They like the other, other colors, such as dark orange or this blue. Again, we use the cardboard tubes, but other people like to use these, what we call laminates. So there's stacks of boards that have like half circles in them, but when put together, they make a whole tunnel so that when uh, they're uh, undone, you can easily slip the nest cells out. But one thing we're finding um, in what has been known for many years by the technical staff at, at our lab is that um, certain kinds of parasites will get in between the grooves of the laminates, whereas other types of parasites will sting through the cardboard of the cardboard tubes. So um, pest or pest, and you kind of just pick your poison here. So the bees have to be stored over the winter up until the time that they are incubated in the springtime. And this is an example of Wonderful Orchard storage area. So this is in a cold room. And um, in the cage propagation that they have, they um, color coded when the nests were made as part of a project. That's why all the tips of these, ends of these nests are colored. But you see that these are wooden nest blocks, but also on the floor there, there are bundles of cardboard tubes. And here's a little close-up of those nests, just to, so you can see how, how pretty they can be. So in the springtime, just before uh, bloom is about at 10%, the bees are incubated. Um, this is a collaborator's incubator where um, he, um, he doesn't do the grand scale that can be done at Wonderful Orchards with their big walk-in cooler that turns into an incubator. This is just, uh, just to show you a different style of incubator that's like a refrigerator. And he uses Tupperware with some uh, loose straw in there for the cocoons to uh, set in, rest in, and then as the bees emerge, they can crawl around on the, the loose straw. And then he can take those uh, containers um, out to the field and just put the loose straw into trees or, actually, or let the cocoons emerge more naturally out of these uh, styrofoam boxes that are meant to keep the heat in a little bit and keep the predators out. Here's another example of, of releasing bees and that's out of uh, pizza boxes that were bought just for this purpose. But in this case, the cocoons were already hatched. 
and then the adults chilled and then sorted out into the pizza boxes, semi-counted to be about 400 females per acre, and then released out in the orchards. And this again is Natalie on the right using those styrofoam boxes again um, for release. But what we found is that if all the bees aren't um, hatched out before you take them to the orchards, then at this time of year, the nights in the orchards are quite cold and it takes a lot of the day before it really warms up again. And so the females are slow to hatch out, but the bloom in the orchards is really fast. So what's a better way of getting these bees to hatch out when it, it's difficult to, um, say, put an incubator on site? Um, this can happen if you have generators and a trailer incubator, but all these things become more and more expensive to do. And then, um, for example, at Wonderful Orchards, we're pollinating in you know uh, 150 acre orchards, and so how do you deal with that out in the field? Well, one innovator, um, uh, Matt Allen, came up with this idea. He said, well, all these honeybee hives are out in the orchards already. Why not put a little compartment on the top of the honeybee hives? Because honeybees regulate their own temperature, which is about the correct temperature for incubating blue orchard bees. And just this year, my team tried this, and voila, the bees came out very quickly by setting con these contraptions on the top of the honeybee hives. Didn't hurt the honeybees whatsoever. The honeybees don't attack the blue orchard bees as they come out, and everybody seems to be happy. And for just a few dollars uh, to pay for some plywood and put it together and with a little screen, you end up with this infield incubator. So another thing that the blue orchard bees need for nesting is the soil that they use to partition and to plug their nest. And here you see pictures of how the bees really do excavate the soil looking for the right texture of and the right moisture content of the clay-like soils that are really good for making these partitions. Well, in some years, like in 2016, it dry, the orchards dried up really, really fast. And so the bees weren't, weren't nesting. So we asked that the company uh, deliver some water in what they call the bee ways, the roads between big orchard sections where they drop off the honeybees. They do have barrels, if you see in the foreground here over on the left, that are full of water for the honeybees, but the blue orchard bees don't visit those barrels, collect their own water, and then go and make mud. They'd like to go where mud already is. So they need puddles that are, that's on the soil, so, or some irrigation that's, that's ongoing. So anyway, so this helped a lot. Once these trucks came through, the nesting went boom, and uh, it was great. Now this year, the opposite problem was, was encountered, whereas uh, it rained and rained and rained, and the bloom kept coming, and even to deliver, to deliver the honeybees was very difficult this year. So uh, there wasn't a problem with mud this year. <laughs> The other thing the bees need are, is the bloom, right? And the whole purpose of them being there is to pollinate these beautiful flowers. So the bees go out and they forage for as long as they can, as long as the bloom lasts. And sometimes the bloom can be only about two weeks. And then, but a bee's life cycle, a nesting cycle could be about six weeks. So what's the female bee to do um, if she's a blue orchard bee or solitary bee that can't that, that won't be carted off on a truck to the next crop to pollinate. So she needs another source of floral resources. So because at some point the orchard's going to look like this, where all the petals have dropped to the ground and uh, the nuts are starting to develop instead. So we have started a project uh, with the UC Davis team to put in these floral enhancements. And this is a one acre floral enhancement from a picture from last year. We had three again this year, which is provided for the bees to use um, during and after bloom. And research has shown uh, that um, the, these flowers don't really compete with the uh, almond flowers closest to them for the bees' attention. And what we find though, is that both the honeybees and blue orchard bees will use these floral enhancements and all the flowers that are used, the species mix, are spring flowers that are native to California, or mostly, most of them are native to California. And you can see in this left-hand picture of the blue orchard bee, 
that her wings are really, really tattered. So this is late in the season, yet she's still out foraging and producing uh, and making nest cells. And uh, that's what these um, graphs here will show you. This is far from the enhancement, a little closer to the enhancements, and then near the enhancements for nests that are actually in the orchards, okay? And where they're far away from the um, orchard enhancements, uh, and even though there's an enhancement present, they don't really increase their nesting. But if you get towards the middle and close to those enhancements, nesting will continue after bloom, which is these lines that are marking um, March the 7th. That's when bloom ended. And so anything past that uh, were nests that were made because those floral enhancements were there or where the um, line has the, the uh, solid dots. So it's a really good deal to put those floral enhancements in. So after all said and done, does the blue orchard bee affect the yield of almonds? And this gra these graphs are just to show you that on the left, um, where we have fruit set in the light green and developing fruits in the dark green, you can see where there's blue orchard bees and honeybees. You have um, a high proportion of fruit set and, but a, a less proportion of the maturing nuts because the nuts actually drop if the con weather conditions aren't that great through the whole season. Um, that's for blue orchard bees and honeybees. On the right is where there's honeybee only. So at the same scale, you can see that the fruit set and maturing nuts are significantly less when there's only honeybees in certain sections of the orchard that were measured uh, for this effect. And these were only 10 acre sections that either had a half a stocking rate of blue orchard bees and um, but also two hives per acre of honeybees. So this is basically, in addition to honeybees, we have the blue orchard bees on the left and you get an increased fruit set. Now nut yield doesn't always um, uh, reflect the activity of the blue orchard bees and that's because of like what I just mentioned that there's nut drop later in the season. So maybe better uh, or a different style, style, uh, type of orchard management or different weather conditions during the year would re better reflect an increase in nut yield. And this year we are doing large demonstration trials to see if that's the case. So moving on uh, out of almonds finally and looking at uh, using blue orchard bees and cherry orchards, again Natalie Boyle was um, wanting to look at how best to use the bees in these orchards. So she was looking at, uh, do the blue orchard bees have a preference for the, the kinds of setups that you put out in the cherry orchards, assuming that management in cherries might be a little different than the management in uh, almonds where spray rigs or whatever might need to be driven in uh, cherry orchards compared to in almond orchards during bloom time. So um, she set out uh, to work in three acre sections um, and then put out cavities for the bees in those sections. And these orchards also had uh, honeybees stocked in them at one hive per acre. And she replicated her experiment to have three sets of where there, were, uh, there was a uniform distribution of those small fiesta boxes with 100 straws or, uh, in these bundles. And then she also had where she had many straws bundled up into a mailbox tote plus a few satellite fiesta boxes around those totes, but in each area there's the same number of nesting tubes. So um, kind of equal opportunity housing wherever they went, but distributed differently. And that's what this looks like in the orchard setup she shows you here. Um, here's where they, she had the mailbox totes with, they were in the center, the red dot, and then the corner satellites, as opposed to the uniform setup where she had uh, 10, uh, fiesta boxes just evenly arranged in these three acre sections. So did that make a difference on how the bees nested? Oh, and here again, just a little close up of this, of the uh, arrangement. So indeed, where the boxes were uniformly distributed and there were more sites to visit, basically, she got a higher average percent nesting and more average live cells per nest box. And so um, these differences were significant. And this is interesting because, you know, if you're going to, whoops, if you're going to use 
the blue orchard bees and cherries, it might be uh, smart not to try to just put them on the edge of the fields or in central locations, but to distribute them throughout the orchard block in the same manner that we do with almonds. Uh, we didn't assess cherry yield in, in these orchards because this was kind of preliminary, but this year Natalie is uh, gonna work in Washington to ask these questions again, as well as get the cherry yield to see if there's an effect uh, where she places the blue orchard bees on the yield. So the Japanese horn-faced bee is another osmia that's used in orchards, but this bee was introduced uh, in the 80s to the eastern U.S. It was from Asia, and um, it's been looked at for its use in apples by the team at Penn State, uh, mostly Dave Bittinger, uh, helped by um, Shelby Fleischer, who presented about pumpkins last week, or two weeks ago. Um, but the thing with apples is that they don't really need a high fruit set in order to get well-formed apples rather than mini apples. And so even though these Japanese orchard bees were uh, placed at the edges of apple orchards, they really didn't change their fruit quality because there's uh, mechanical or um, chemical or mechanical thinning of these apples. Um, and there's also a lot of abundant pollinators around these areas. It's a very, um, the eastern part of the U.S. where orchards are, are more heterogeneous than the um, intensely agricultural landscapes in California. So we didn't see an effect of these bees on apples. So um, the team moved into cherries where a higher fruit set is desired for uh, good yield. And they're doing ongoing studies, so there's more uh, information coming out this year. Um, and uh, in this situation, they again released bees just at the edges of the orchard with about 250 females plus the males at each of their nest sites. And um, I don't have any data for them right now because it's still preliminary, but uh, um, this is kind of how they their setup was. You can see there's a forested area here and the, the top part of the graph. And then where they have the osmia nest is in the, where the red dot is. And they were taking data from all these different numbered trees on uh, what bees were visiting osmia and also native bees that were coming out of the different habitats and kind of comparing what is going on near the forest edge versus uh, further out into more intensely uh, farmed areas of the, of the fields to see if there's a difference in pollination. So uh, I don't have that data to show you, but um, I do have a little bit from the same kind of study that's ongoing in Michigan cherries, uh, where blue orchard bees were added to the edges of their orchards. And here are some very preliminary data um, that, you know, it's not published yet. But what you can see is that um, measurements taken of the fruit density per limb cross-sectional area, it's just a way to kind of uh, standardize the data collection. What you see is that uh, the fruit density from the edge which is zero meters all the way out to say the center of these orchards, about a hundred meters, where there's honeybee only, the centers of the orchards seem to have the best pollination and fruit density. And that you can see in both 2014 and 2015, although in general, the yield in 2015 is, is less. But if you add the blue orchard bees, which I mean, sorry, the Japanese orchard bees, which are only at the edge of the field, what you can see is that there's an evening out of this pollination effect and, the, and where the fruit density occurs, such that in, in both uh, years where the, um, the edge of the field is located next to the bees, there is an increase in the amount of a fruit set. However, in 2015, in general, the, the orchards that were used were, did not yield very high across the entire uh, orchard. So that's why this data is preliminary. Uh, we need to look at some more such that you can see um, that, you know, just really the edges are affected by the Japanese orchard bee that um, was intentionally placed there, although this bee also occurs naturally in these areas. So again, where the honeybee only is on those edges, this is, these data are only for the zero meters. So right next to the edge of the orchard, where honeybee only are is the 
impact on fruit density is less than where the orchard bees are added. So the one thing I promised to talk about a little bit more was the exposure to pesticide and I just want to highlight kind of the difference between honeybees, social bees, and then the osmia, the solitary bees. And that's like where would they come into contact with pesticides in the environment. And if you think about honeybees in their colony, they have a lot of wax. Um, they um, also engage in trophallaxis, so they share uh, food between adults and from adults to immature. So if they're regurgitating nectar and feeding that back and forth, then they could uh, expose each other if nectar is a uh, contaminant. Um, the workers feed each other and they feed in the nest and they feed out in the field. And then their foraging distance is greater than three miles. So they can get out there and uh, really be exposed to all different kinds of landscapes where there's no control by the, the grower over you know, what the bees possibly would be in contact with. The osmia bees, the cavity nesting bees, in this case, Osmia lignaria would be in contact with the soil because she's picking that up for her uh, nest partitions. And then her nesting tunnel itself, if it were accidentally sprayed with a pesticide or contaminated somehow, she would be in contact with that. Larvae would be in contact with the mass provision after mom put the pollen and nectar there, which could be contaminated. And But her landscape is a lot smaller. It's Usually they forage around uh, 50 meters from their nest. They can go further, but if they don't have to, they, they won't. And they're not a big colon, they're not like a colony that has a lot of workers that go all over the place. But in common, both of these types of bees encounter water in the environment, the pollen and nectar from the flowers, and then the mother herself is a source of contamination for the eggs inside her body, and then eventually the, the larvae that don't uh, don't develop from those eggs uh, if, if that's the case. The thing about honeybees is that a bunch if a lot of workers go out and and die there's still workers still in the hive that can grow up and 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 or prematurely become foragers and kind of save the colony if it doesn't get below a critical letter level and that's called colony resilience. So as long as the queen honeybee is still laying eggs that colony can survive. But with the cavity, with the solitary bees, in this case the osmia, they don't recover. If, if a female is out foraging and she dies, then that's it. The reproduction in her nest is done and her lineage is over. So um, those are just two things to consider. And um, one last thing here about pesticides is that there are ways to get around necessary sprays that happen during bloom and in California almonds it's it's fungicide applications but in cherries it can also be others. Um, so if you can spray when the bees aren't active that's a, a good time to um, to do so. It um, There's always a consequence of what lingers uh, on the flowers the next day and if it's wet you know whether that's a, a worse for the bees than if it were to dry overnight. But um, you know, that's one thing that can be done, and it is, it is often tried in California almonds, um, not always successfully. So to integrate orchard pollination with management strategies, which is what ICP is all about, we have to understand what the crop needs. We have to understand what the pollinator needs and what it prefers and how it behaves. We have to know what resources it's going to have to have in order to reproduce and so it needs forage and nesting materials. And we have to develop integrative pest and pollinator, pest and pollinator management approach, approaches that might safeguard the bees or sustain them better in uh, cropping systems. And for the grower, that person has to determine whether there's an economic, uh, economically viable way to incorporate pollinator safety or pollinator alternatives into the cropping systems in order to produce a crop and, um, and to, to gain rewards in the end. So um, that's all I have to deliver to you today. I want to acknowledge that this project and much of what I spoke about today was funded by USDA NIFA 
and USDA Agricultural Research Service, uh, who I work for. And um, our project was the Integrated Crop Pollination uh, Project, which you can find on the web. Uh, lastly, I want to just end with this slide to show you that uh, in case you didn't get to see all of the other presentations, they are available, um, but just here to look at um, what it is you have missed and, uh, and hope that you continue to look back in, the, in them and, uh, and learn more or revisit what you thought you learned or, or just have more questions about. So I appreciate your time and attention and I'll turn it back over to the moderators to uh, ask questions. Great. Thanks so much for a, a super presentation, Teresa. We do have a, a number of questions. We're going to try and get through as many as we can in the time that we have left. So the first question comes from Catherine Prince. She's asking, what is the compound in the spray-on attractant used on mm -hmm. nest bundles? Well, well, it's a fatty acid. Um, it's actually, it's patented, and there is, a, someone just bought the license to that patent, and he's selling it. So it's available at crownbees.com. So um, I think that's okay to plug that, I guess. And I don't think it's, I think you can look up the patent, just Google uh, Orchard Bee Attractant or Bee Attractant Patent, and uh, all that information will come up. It probably isn't inappropriate for me to give you the formula, though. <laughs> Great. So we have um, another question from Mario at Michigan State University. And Mario asks, are there any reports of the kind of soil texture um, orchard bees prefer? And I'm guessing because he's in Michigan, he's specifically thinking about Japanese orchard bees, but I'm sure people would appreciate answers related to blue orchard bees too. Right. Um, that is a very good question and one that people have tried to answer. Um, even in California, some people were thinking that there was some magic mud, they called it, and they found it, and they gathered it, and they brought it to those giant enclosures to make sure that the bees would have uh, the exact right kind of mud, even though they didn't understand all the properties. Um, it turns out that I think the right moisture content and not too sandy is probably the, the trick, you know, make sure it stays together. Um, what, what some kind of dabbling into research found was that as long as you keep your piles of dirt wet, the bees will use them and they'll just kind of dig in to get the right moisture content. Uh, there has been a company that looked into the properties of different soil types um, and that you would find as mud plugs, but nothing really came out of that. Um, it's a good question, uh, but I, I, no, I don't know that there's any real answer to that. You know, I just think it just has to stay together. <laughs> um, Mario also asked, what is the female to nesting cavity ratio? Um, in the commercial settings, it seems that we find um, two females, or it's, uh, now that you asked, let's see, it's three to one, three males to one female, usually, but in some cases, it's higher sex ratio of females. It kind of just depends. <laughs> And if you put out uh, three females in an orchard and, and uh, oh, sorry, three males in an orchard and one, no, three females and one male. It's the other way around. Sorry. I mean, what, this is what normally it is. Okay. Three males and one female. Yeah. Um, how many actually, uh, how many cavities do you need to put out for that? We one typically female? put out two cavities per female. It's only the females that are going to use the cavities. The males, sometimes when we just purchase males, we don't get three males for every female, we'll get just two or one and a half males per female. It doesn't take that many males to get the jobs done, right? So as long as they don't die or something. Um, but the, we hope that each female will make at least two nests if they stay. And that's the other trick is that not all the females that we put out stay. That's why we developed the lure to try to get more of them to stay. And so, um, you know, what you hope for, what we hope for in the orchard setting is to get one and a half times back females than what we put out. So for each female we put out, we hope to get one and a half times females back just because of the short nesting season and the fact that they go somewhere, we don't know where. <laughs> so uh, we're, we'll continue to explore that with new experiments. Great, and then we also have a comment from Dave saying it would be nice to see studies of fungicide smell and osmia. Do you know of any studies looking at um, how osmia might be impacted by fungicide smell? 
No, I don't. Um, although we did a little trial in our lab where we fed the bees uh, sugar water laced with fungicide. So they ingested it and they also could have uh, touched the, the wicks we were feeding them from with antennae. And then we took their antennae and cut them off and tested uh, their ability to, to smell floral odors. So it was a, we tested them with an electro antennagram. So you got an electrical pulse signal on a computer. If the uh, antennae still responded in a normal way to these floral odors, and yes, they did. So the gunking up of the antennae because of the fungicides or the direct ingestion of the fungicides didn't mess up their sensory apparatus. Now, what it does to their brain is something else <laughs> that I don't know about. So uh, I don't know if they smell the fungicide um, per se, but that little experiment points to it's not really at that level, but I can't say for sure. Great. Um, so I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to ask uh, one more question that's in the Q&A box right now, but we'll mm -hmm. answer the remaining questions um, by email later to those that we don't get to. So feel free to add questions still if you have questions. But um, the last question for right now um, asks, what is the parasit parasitism percentage of nests? Wow. Well, um, that it could be really low in some cases. It depends on how you manage your bees and when you have them. So for example, in the almond orchards, you don't get that many parasites if you start out with really clean bees. So you don't put the parasites out because that time of year is way early and even the parasites aren't out. But later when out in California, when they're propagating, mass propagating the bees in those cages, the parasites will naturally occur. So then you would expect to get more parasites. And if you're not cleaning them up, you can, you can start to kind of generate your own populations of parasites and then you get them bad. So it just depends on, on how good of a manager you are. Great. Thanks so much, Teresa. I'll pass it uh, to John to wrap things up, but thanks for a great presentation and thanks everyone for great questions. So thank you. Over, over to you, John. Oh, I'd like to thank the panelists and all the participants. You had excellent questions. That was an excellent presentation, Teresa. Um, and all these presentations are available on the Bee Health uh, org site, YouTube channel uh, for recordings. And the last two will be available soon. Um, all the other ones are up there now. And we hope you've enjoyed this series. I think it's been quite worthwhile and, and a lot of educational material has been presented.